First thing that we want to do in um, preparing our parts for assembly is get them uh, cleaned up, remove any plastic. Um, as you can see here, we do tend to leave plastic on the parts to keep them safe in, in shipping and during manufacturing. This bulkhead, bulkhead 8, did have plastic on it and I have removed it. So as you can see from the factory, a lot of the times there's red ink on it. Um, we might mark a few things for whatever reason. Um, so we'll want to make sure that we get the plastic pulled off, get all that ink gone. If that ink is not completely gone, I promise you it will come back when you go to prime this. It's a magic trick that we have come to uh, dislike very much. We'll think we have a part perfectly clean and then we'll spray some primer on it and guess what? That ink comes out of nowhere and you have to sand it back out and reprime the part. So make sure that that ink comes off really, really well. Um, another place that you're going to want to focus when you're cleaning this is in these little grooves here where we've deburred the metal before forming. You're going to want to take your lacquer thinner or your carb spray, whatever you're using to clean, and a little bit of red scotch bright and get rid of whatever plastic residue or even plastic is still left there. The next step is to check the part for burrs, defects. These quarter inch holes, we use those for tooling and to form the bulkhead. And sometimes what will happen is you'll see that that raises up kind of like a little volcano. And the reason is because when we're forming this, it pulls the metal tight around that bolt that goes there and creates a pucker. So we'll want to inspect those, make sure there's no puckers. And then we'll go ahead and check the edges for burrs as well. I'm going to grab this air hose here real quick. Wear your safety gear, hearing protection, eye protection, face protection, lung protection, all that good stuff. Don't get stupid. All I'm trying to do with this blue roll lock is take off any burrs that would be on that edge. If you feel, and of course I've got gloves on right now, I should probably remove those. If you can feel with your thumbnail a little nick or a burr or a scratch, that needs to come out or that will turn into a crack eventually. So right now on that edge, I don't feel anything concerning. And of course we'll have to flip it over and do the other side as well. And we'll do that here in a little bit. But also one thing you want to do is make sure that these holes, again, are, they don't have raised edges around them and that they are burr-free. Now the benefit to the roll lock is that it's quick. You could also be using a hole deburring tool. Um, sandpaper, again, don't use anything coarser than two, 220 grit on aluminum unless we um, specifically ask for it in the instructions. And when you're doing your deburring with sandpaper especially, make sure you're going with the edge, not against it, because what that can cause is a crack. So um, we'll finish deburring this whole part the same way, and uh, then we will show you how to prime. Okay, so now we have all of our parts prepped for um, primer. We've deburred them, we've cleaned them, um, and we are ready to spray. As you can see, we've already sprayed a little test area here. Uh, we did that because we were messing with the gun settings and we had to redo the settings and um, wanted them to be appropriate. So this is bulkhead 8. This is the last bulkhead on the fuselage, on the STL fuselage. It carries um, your horizontal stabilizer brackets here and we've got some rudder cable through holes. This is where your rudder, cable, or your rudder um, hinge attaches. And then on the inside of the airplane, this is where your tail wheel mount goes. Um, and of course, the front side of the bulkhead is what we're looking at now. So some of the products that we like to use to prime, uh, this SEM self-etching primer. Now this is very convenient. You can get it at any automotive paint supply store in, uh, in your town. And the, the thing about this is while it says self-etching, you definitely want a scotch bright with a red scotch bright your aluminum parts first or it won't adhere very well um, despite what it says. Now if you have bigger facilities, um, a spray booth, um, a spray gun, 
um, high capacity air compressor, you know, real painting equipment. You can use this stuff here, which is Omni self etching primer. And this stuff is also available at the same automotive supply stores, uh, paint supply stores. Let me clarify that. And this stuff is very, very nasty. It's if you get this in your lungs, it's going to make you cough like crazy. Make sure, make absolutely sure you're wearing all your safety gear. This stuff is gnarly, but it does etch very well. And you do need a lot less um, prep on the aluminum parts. You do need to clean them still with a good grease and wax remover. Um, Lacquer thinner works if you don't have a, a grease and wax remover, but a grease and wax remover is preferred. Again, that's also available at your local automotive paint supply store. This here is the reducer for that Omni Paint. It's a one to one ratio. Um, now, if you don't have a PPG store in town, um, other companies make essentially the same thing. It's a very standard product in the automotive industry and it works very well. So, um, those are the products we use. Make sure that you're not getting overspray all over your neighbor's car. Um, last thing you want is for your neighbors to turn you in for doing um, things that they find senseless. So make sure, safety gear, don't upset your neighbors, don't fumigate your house. Make sure you're doing this in a well-ventilated, appropriate area. Um, and then of course, make sure you read the tech data sheets for everything here before you use it. So let me get my respirator on and we'll go ahead and prime this bulkhead. Oh no, look at that. Luckily we did this intentionally, but that's that nasty magic trick I was telling you about. The Sharpie came right back. Now, we knew that that was going to be there. That's the serial number for this airplane. We will go ahead and pen that back in over that so it looks pretty. But if you don't clean your parts right, that's what's going to happen. A lot of people will tell you to put this stuff on pretty light. As you can see, I like to put it on wet. Um, just to make sure it bites in. We usually only do one coat here, but we do check for missed spots, especially in between scenes. Uh, we will be doing some touch-ups later for our customers just to make their airplane look pretty before it goes out the door. Uh, but for now, I think that's good enough. You can see here we use the Omni Primer on the bulkhead. This is bulkhead 7. And we use the SEM Gray Primer on these BH7-1s. So the purpose of these is to take the loads from the stabilizer. The, the front spar of the stabilizer. And so we want to make sure that these are done properly and very well. What you see here is AN3 hardware and it's only temporary. This is not the correct hardware for this and actually when you're done riveting these on you need to make sure that this hardware comes off and gets put back where it goes. So this right now is the only thing that we have to rivet together prior to skinning the fuselage so that's why we're doing this now so this hardware is holding these plates in place temporarily we're going to go ahead and drill number 30 through these holes now this in this case is better than Clico's because we know that these holes were drilled on the CNC machine and the alignment is perfect okay Clecos do wiggle a little bit, so that's why the bolts in this case are better. So let's go ahead and drill these right now. And again, this is a sharp number 30. Don't use dull bits. Now some people would be better off doing this in a fixture of some sort. Doing it by hand. Drilling these by hand is definitely the fastest way, but make sure that you're very steady and that your drill is actually square to the part when you do it. So we'll just put the chips there for now. We'll vacuum this carpet off later. And that is why we work with carpet is so that the chips fall down into the carpet and don't scratch the materials that we're working with. So now that everything's drilled, what I want to do is pull this plate off and actually 
I need to grab a sharpie real quick. Okay, we're gonna label these. I like to label in between parts A, and again, in between parts A. That way when we put these back together right, they go together and the, the label is hidden. So, we know that they're appropriately labeled. We're gonna use our deburring tool. And there's all kinds of deburring tools out there. You can use something like this. You can use the little Chavive ones, which have the little the hook on them. Um, if you wanted to do this before priming, and you wanted to use um, 220 grit sandpaper, you could do that. You could twist an oversized drill bit in between your fingers. That'll take care of the deburring as well. So we're going to go ahead and deburr these. And uh, once that's done, we'll bolt everything back together like it was. And we'll put some rivets in. Once the rivets are in, we will remove the bolts and we can continue skinning the fuselage. We went ahead and deburred our parts. Then we bolted them back together. And you can see here we've already gone ahead and riveted one side. So it's common practice to put the factory head of the rivet on the side of whatever material is thinnest. So because the bulkhead is thinner than the plate, we want the, fa the sh um, factory head of the rivet to be here on the back side of the bulkhead. And of course, the shop head on the front side of the bulkhead. And again, these plates go on the front of the bulkhead, not the back. But we had to pull these bolts out for access to these two rivets. And that's fine now because these rivets are already holding everything in place. Again, get comfortable. If you're not comfortable, you'll make a mistake. Nobody's immune. You could hear that sound change. That's when the rivets had just enough. So when I hold this bucking bar, I'm making sure that I'm holding this as well, that I could feel everything, that it's not slipping around. And I'm trying to do that at the same time I'm doing this. And as long as you've practiced on your other things first, you're not going to have any problems. Okay. All right. Pinch it nice and tight so nothing slides around. There's that sound change. And there are our rivets. And we will check it with our go no go gauge here. This gauge shows us where things would ideally be as far as diameter and height. This is a side skin to the, the fuselage tail. This plastic is great in that it keeps the airplane safe while you're doing construction. However, it's a major pain in the butt when you're trying to do riveting. Um, several ways you can deal with that. First off, you can kind of pull this plastic back as you go and just tear it by hand and make a path for your rivets. Um, you can remove the plastic entirely and just be careful with your project. Uh, those are two options. Another option here, if you've fabric covered an airplane before, you probably already have one of these um, little fabric iron. Right now we've got this one set. It was set at 300 and it's climbing on the way up to uh, 350 degrees. We can actually take this edge, this sharper edge of the iron here and kind of score the plastic. Don't move too fast, don't move too slow. We're not scoring the plastic so heavily that we're damaging the, fu uh, the fuselage skin. See, when we got to that bubble there, I could feel it actually cutting it. I'll do the same thing on the other side of the rivet line. I may have moved a little too fast right there, we'll find out. Okay, so now we can go ahead and start the plastic. Ooh, look at that, it's going. You can see we pulled both sides of it. We did not score the aluminum. You don't want to score your aluminum ever. And that's explained in the manual. Um, if you score your aluminum, that's cause for concern. That could turn into a crack. And of course on the outside of the airplane, which this is, it's the exterior skin. If you did find a score line like that, um, you can polish it out. And our manual tells you as well 
what to do about dents, dings, scratches, all that kind of stuff on this airplane. Because it, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to dent it somewhere. That's just all there is to it. A little tiny ding from a ratchet or something like that. Something, maybe you've got a couple kids and they're out playing where they shouldn't have been and dropped something on the fuselage. Don't panic. When you find a dent or a scratch in the fuselage that you had hoped to polish, look how well that works. Don't panic. Um, even if it's not in the manual, call us. We will teach you how to take care of those things. So another method, if you don't have the iron, is to take sandpaper and score the plastic. This is 220 grit. Um, and we use this grit because if we did hit the aluminum by accident, it's not coarse enough to cause you any real problems. So we discovered this when we were doing some deburring of, of holes. And it wasn't even true deburring of the holes. I shouldn't say that. It was knocking burrs loose. You see these little guys here? Those come off the router. We're knocking those loose to roll some skins, the forward skins. And we didn't want those denting the skins. So we pulled them out with a scotch bright and found out that if you score the plastic with a piece of sandpaper, it tends to follow that score line. And there it goes there. Now this is a little bit more difficult than the iron sometimes because you've got multiple score lines and it tends to walk. But if you don't have an iron, this works out really, really well. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and continue to do this to the whole skin, to all the skins actually, um, all the tail skins at least for now. And we're going to want to get the rivet lines. We're also want, going to want to get the overlaps where the skins overlap. And then, so after we do that, then um, we're ready to start clicoing things together. And uh, we'll clico the belly skin to the bulkheads and show you how that should look. And then we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, so as you can see here, we've got the bulkheads clicoed into the belly skin. We've got BH7-1 riveted to the front side of bulkhead 7. Uh, that's what we did in our last step. Now, the easiest way to start laying these bulkheads into the skin is to put a bit of preload on the skin, some curvature with these ratchet straps. And it doesn't have to be a lot. Um, we usually do a ratchet strap in front of bulkhead 7 and behind bulkhead 5. And that allows the bulkheads, once you start clicoing them into place, to not be so floppy. Because if you just clico this center here, it's going to bend the tab. The way the bulkhead will bend the tab. So you want to clico the center, then you want to clico somewhere on the side, and that will give it some stiffness, and then you can finish clicoing every other hole. Now, as you can see, we've marked the skin here with an arrow, okay? That is the center clico, the center rivet hole on the skin. You can measure, when the, when the skin is flat, you can measure to find the center hole. And then in this case, back here, you can see that there is no center hole. You have two holes that straddle the center line of the skin. Now, marking those out will help you to orient the bulkheads, as will paying attention to these rudder cable pass-throughs. You want to make sure that those rudder cable pass-throughs left to right are the, the same height in relation to the edge of the skin. That'll tell you if there's any um, positioning errors. So that's what we did. Got everything clicked in. Again, every other hole on the tab or one hole per tab is another way of looking at it. Um, that'll allow us to drill these up to number 30. So the next step is to drill these to number 30. And of course we'll replace those with the copper clecos as we go and pull out the silver clecos and then re open them all up to number 30. Make sure you're using a really, really sharp drill bit. Don't be afraid to buy a whole bunch of drill bits and throw them away. The sharper the drill bit, the less likely you are to get a burr. Um, and of course, pull this all back apart deburr the holes, and then put it back together with the copper clecos before you start riveting. So what we're going to do now is we are going to drill these holes just like we told you to do. We're going to rivet them, and then once this skin is riveted onto these bulkheads, we'll go ahead and um, dig into the sides. It may seem like a simple matter to drill a hole, right? How hard can it be? But there's a few things we need to consider here. First off, we should always drill from the skin side into the bulkhead. The idea being if we 
screw up, if we mess something up, it's on the inside of the airplane, easily replaceable. We're not worried about, you know, did we misdrill a fuselage skin hole? That would be bad. So I'm looking through this hole here. We, of course, we've got Clecos, one Cleco per tab on the bulkhead. I'm looking through this hole here, and I'm making sure that that tab on the inside is lined up well enough to open up to number 30. Now, if it's not, we can take the bulkhead and we can kind of pivot it around. But this one is pretty well lined up. We've got a drill stop on the drill. Some people prefer not to use them. Um, and actually, in this case right here, I'm not going to use it because I know that I'll be happier that way personally. Now, make sure you know where the tip of that drill bit is at. If you don't, especially with a drill stop, you could put a hole there not there and with a new drill bit it's very easy to miss drill so I double checked everything's lined up I'm gonna go ahead and drill a hole nice high RPM I let the drill bit do the cutting we're gonna come down here to this one I can see that the tab is lined up same exact thing and we'll just keep doing that all around the fuselage and again once this hole is drilled, we'll put a Clico in it, a copper Clico, and we'll remove that one so we can open that hole up next. Okay, so here you can see we've removed the Clicos, we've opened up all the holes to number 30, we've deburred everything, we've riveted, um, and this is just the belly skin. Now take note, we don't rivet any of the holes in this line here. Okay, and that's the same as this line here. We don't want to put a rivet there because of the skin overlap. So the next step, now that this is riveted, is to Clico on the left side skin, and then we'll go ahead and open up every other hole, replace the silver Clicos with copper ones, open up every other hole again to number 30, and then pull everything back apart, deburr it, and rivet it, just the same as we did this one. Now you can see we've got the left side skin installed. And on top of that, we have the right side skin installed. Now when you're going to Clico, the left side skin to the belly. On this line here, it's easiest to do two Clicos, two holes, two Clicos, two holes, and so forth. The reason is that allows you a little bit more room to get your bucking bar in between Clicos. Now you do have a little bit more access on the front side of the bulkheads here when you're drilling. So you when you Clico the bulkheads, you should leave one hole, Clico, one hole, Clico, and so forth. That makes things pretty simple. So after this, the left side skin is installed, it's best to start the right side skin at the top spine. Okay, so this is fully riveted all along the, the spine. The reason that we do it that way before we Clico it down the sides is because when you curve this, there becomes, especially towards the tail, a lot of pressure built up on this seam. Okay, and if you have Clicos up here, what's going to end up happening is you're going to get an unsightly gap right there. So what we want to do is make sure that that's riveted first, not Clico. And then the next step is to go ahead and pull this down. We'll use our bulkhead rivet lines to make sure everything's lined up. We'll do the two two and two Clicos along the bottom side here. And then once that's done, all the way along this bottom, we'll have an employee on the inside helping to adjust these bulkheads into position. And we'll do the every other hole on the bulkheads. Now, to make your life easier, notice that these bulkheads do take an S-shaped curvature. And that's normal. You want that S-shape to be pulled forward because it's gonna make the guy's life, whoever's on the inside, a lot easier getting that bulkhead into position. So once all these are Clicoed, the bulkheads and the side skins, you open up the intermediate holes to number 30, replace those with the copper Clicos, open up the remaining holes to number 30, open it back up just like it is, do your deburring, blow it out nice and clean, and then Clico it back up, and your buddy can climb inside the airplane with his bucking bar. And we use this green three inch high density foam here. And this helps keep the airplane safe from elbows, knees, um, 
you know, uh, a falling bucking bar or whatever. Um, so next time you see this, it'll be completely buttoned up. And I should point out here that Timber Tiger Aircraft is very proud of the technology that we've put into this airplane as far as getting all these holes drilled right from the factory on both the skins and the bulkheads. So we have not had to drill any of these holes manually as far as locating them. We've only had to Clico and open them up. We've got at this point about five hours of labor into the assembly and riveting. And so that's, think about that. That's something that you and your buddy can do between breakfast and lunch and be to this phase. All right, so as we told you earlier, you will get dents and scratches and other things on your fuselages when you're building them. That's just part of the process. And I didn't want to jinx us, but we also did the same thing. Um, we buck thousands of these rivets and every now and then, and this is our first one on this fuselage, we get a booger like that. You can see that um, the, the bucking bar slipped off of the rivet and because these aren't the countersunk rivets, we do run the risk of give, getting a smiley in the aluminum. So you can also see there's a little bit of a divot there. Um, this is where a lot of builders might panic. Don't panic. We're going to show you how to fix that right now. So if you don't mind, David, I will hand you this steel dolly. Actually I, actually, I don't want the dolly. I'll have the steel dolly. You take the steel punch and the hammer. What we're going to do is make sure that this steel dolly is flat against that. We want to take care of just this area here. We don't want to be off a little bit. When David's on the back. He's going to be punching the back side of that flat. So, go ahead. Check. Okay, so you can see that we took out most of that crater right there. It's mostly gone. Um, I think, David, if you don't mind, let's give it one more whack. Uh, if you can, focus a little bit more pressure towards the back side of the hole. Okay, so we took out most of that crater. Now when we rivet it's going to put a little bit of a pucker there anyway so we don't need to worry about getting it perfect perfect. Um, but what we wanted to do is work that out enough to where now we could take our 220 grit sandpaper and work out the smiley because that's where the cracks going to form. If we don't get that out, that smiley, that's going to turn into a crack. So we're going to sand this out with 220 grit. We're going to sand that back out with 400 grit. And then once that's done, we're going to polish it out. And we're going to use this pistol grip polisher here and some coarse compound. Just work it back and forth. And then we'll clean up our mess, put the rivet in, and we can resume what we were doing. Okay, so this is the rivet that we had messed up. You can see we sanded it out with 220 grit right in the vicinity of the damage. And then we... Um, went ahead and polished it out with the heavy compound on the pistol grip buffer. Now you can see that there's still a little bit of a crater there. There's no way we're going to be able to hammer and dolly that out with the bulkhead in the way. So what we're going to try doing is smashing the rivet down, bucking the rivet about halfway, and then we're going to go ahead and punch the rivet outward with the hammer again, carefully of course, so we don't slip. And then once it's punched out, you're going to see that it's going to have a little bit of a gap around the head of the rivet. We don't want that so then once we're satisfied that the metals come out with the rivet, then we will finish bucking the rivet to its full, um, full compression. So let's go ahead and put a rivet in. I'll try and give it just a little bit of a buck. And actually, if you look at it now, if we just went ahead and bucked that and left it, it would be fine. But never hurts to try something new. Okay. Nope. Another one. A little harder. One more. Uh, give it one more. Perfect. All right, let's go ahead and finish bucking that.
Yep, it did exactly what we thought it would. It lifted up a little bit of a, yep. a little bit of a gap there. Or it's also loose now. We don't want that. Tell me when. Go. That looks really good. So by the time the airplane is all riveted, polished, or painted, but polished especially, that will be gone. So, um, mission accomplished. Somewhere in this line of rivets is the rivet that we just repaired. As you can see, it's very difficult to tell which one it is. The moral of the story here is to not panic when you ding, dent, or scratch your airplane. We have ways to fix all these different things, and you can give us a call if you have any concerns. One big thing you need to be aware of is if you do make an attempt to repair a ding or a scratch, you can't remove too much metal. So if you have any questions about what you can do, be sure to call us. Don't put yourself in an unsafe situation. Um, as for this particular rivet, this particular situation, I would call that a pretty successful repair. Okay, we're done doing the riveting on the tail section now. It's completely where we want it. Um, few, few rivet holes left. Uh, the customers have to take care of those. We can't do those here. We have to make sure that we're abiding by the FAA's 51% rule. One of the features of the Ryan ST is that it has a conical tail section that mates with a cylindrical forward section. And the change in taper has to be accounted for. So to do this, we've laid out one inch green tape and as you can see, that tape is right to the edge of the skin. And what that does is it gives us a guideline for some hammer and dolly work, which we're going to do here to add in a bevel around the tail skin. So you can see here that the dolly he's using is a plastic dolly. It's got a curved side, which is the side that he's going to have towards the skin. You can see that curve right there. And it's got a flat side. Now if all you have is a steel dolly, that'll work just as well, but you've got to be a little more careful with it. So he's going to put that dolly right to that one inch line, and then he's going to hit the outside of those little tabs there, and it's going to start to form a bevel. And he's going to go all the way around this a few times, and then we'll show you what that looks like. So go ahead and start. We'll keep doing this until we're satisfied with the results, and we will show you those in a few minutes. This is the final flange. He didn't have to bend it too awful much with the hammer and dolly. And again, this crease is one inch from that front edge. Okay. Now, one thing that we want to do is fit bulkhead four into position and make sure that it's actually appropriately aligned with these and that no excess pressure is required to make bulkhead four fit the skin. So as you can see, everything is match drilled, again, undersized from the factory. All we got to do, push it into place, put in a Clico. It really is that easy. All right, now we have the tail section of the fuselage all completely riveted. It's upside down on the table right now. You don't want it right side up. Upside down is easiest to work with. We have the front edge hanging off the table. We've got a ratchet strap here to hold it down tight so it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, make sure that you're keeping your fuselage safe. We've also gone ahead and riveted the forward fuselage skins at the belly seam. There are three sections. There's a forward set, middle set, and a rear set on the forward skins. And the right skin overlaps the left skin, always. It doesn't matter if it's a seam at the top or the bottom. Always make sure that the right is overlapping the left. Because this is all computer cut, we've taken really, really small measurements into account to get this to line up. 
And if you overlap the left over the right, things aren't gonna line up just the way you want. So we ended up riveting all these and now we are ready to start hanging them on the tail. The whole project up to this point has been fun, of course, but the fun's really kicking in now that we're hanging these front skins. As you can see, we've got bulkhead four installed. Bulkhead four has to go on, and when I say installed, just with Clecos. Bulkhead four has to be Clecoed onto the tail section with these skins. Okay, it's a three a three layer unit. You've got the skins, then you've got the tail skins, and then you have bulkhead four on the inside. So you have to do all those at once. Now we've got bulkhead three up here just to add some stability to the skins. It just makes things a little less floppy, a little easier to, ma to manipulate. And again, remember, the right skin overlaps the left skin. And because the airplane's upside down, uh, don't, don't get confused. Over here, you can see we've got our 330 seconds cleat goes in. What we're gonna do now is open up these this front line only to number 30. Once that's opened up to number 30, we're gonna switch Clecos, copper Clecos in here, and then I'll take these ones out and open those up to number 30 so that that whole front row is number 30. Pull everything apart, deburr it, and then you can go ahead and rivet this whole line. Now, this line does not get even opened up to number 30 until this front line is completely riveted. Once this front line is completely riveted, then you can open up those to number 30. And the reason is, is because we are trying to force a taper about this point from here, somewhere between here and here. Now, you're going to get chips in here from your number 30 drill bit. It's important to blow those out and remove them. The best way to blow those chips out is actually from inside the airplane, forcing the air that way. You can use... Well, I don't have it here right now with me, but you can use a pick to very, very gently remove any chips or anything else on the inside. If you have something in there that's concerning, you can always take a piece of sandpaper on a popsicle stick or something else that's thin and kind of work those burrs loose. But you shouldn't have too many issues if you're using a very, very fresh, sharp drill bit. So, um, yeah, so now we're going to go ahead and open these up to number three like I just described. We're going to go ahead and put some rivets in and then uh, we will go from there. We're working on bulkhead four, and I wanted to take a minute to show you a little bit about moving this metal. So, as you can see, we've riveted this front line completely. And as we said, you leave the second line drilled to the smaller size, you don't open it up to number 30 until this is completely riveted. So, we riveted this, then we opened up all these holes to number 30, we took care of chips and burrs, and then we put in every single rivet with some tape. You want every single rivet in place. Don't skip any rivets right now, because if you do, your holes are going to start to misalign as you rivet every other one, and you don't want that misalignment. So right now, we're going to be closing up this gap. That's the goal here. Now when we go to do every other rivet, we're going to rivet one, skip one, rivet, and then you're going to see a giant pucker here. Don't panic about that pucker, that's perfectly normal. And that's the point of what we're showing you right now is how to get rid of that. So we're going to go ahead and rivet in every other rivet now, and then we'll come back and show you that pucker and how to remove it. All right, so we've riveted every other rivet in the back row of rivets on bulkhead four. You can see it makes these nasty looking puckers. And at this time, you might be rethinking your life decisions. But don't, because once you're done, you'll get what you see from here to here. So we've riveted all these, and you can still see a little bit of a pucker, but we'll show you how to work that down uh, in the manual with just a little bit of a piece of wood and a gentle tap with a hammer. That'll displace that pucker up into here, and it'll make it disappear. So right now, we're going to come back up and get the remaining rivets to show you how that pucker goes down. And you always want to work, anytime you're riveting the back line on bulkhead four, you always want to work from the belly down. And the reason is because there's a lot more metal to displace up here. And if you start in the middle and work your way to the belly, you're going to lock too much metal up in here. You want to work it down. Well, uh, I guess it's up since the airplane's upside down. You 
can see that I'm setting the rivet before, before we bucket. Okay, so now we have a larger number of much, much smaller puckers. And again, you can take a block of wood, put it right on this edge here, in a very gentle tap, and as you work these back and forth, eventually you'll move the metal in between rivets and that disappears. Okay, we're done riveting bulkhead four entirely. And you can see we still have a few of those ripples that we were talking about. Um, so I'm going to show you how to get rid of those. I like to use a block of wood that has a nice rounded nose to it. Um, you can use whatever you find, but this seems to be the way that works the best because it can get right in there. So I'll go ahead and work this. I'll take this one here. It's the gnarliest one. Right on the edge, right on the corner of the middle there. Back and forth until you're happy with it. And if you want to get it further than that, you can go ahead and take a harder piece of wood. I'm using MDF now. A harder piece of wood would get rid of that a little better. Sounds noisy, but that's just the hollow tube effect. It's I'm not hitting it very hard at all. So if you got a little more, we'll go ahead and continue to take care of those. But uh, as you can see, just a few taps makes a huge difference. And um, like I said, we'll keep working this back and forth until we're happy with it, and it's as easy as that. These are the upper laundrons. As you can see, the back section of the laundron is made up of two pieces, a forward section and a rear section. Make sure you get these holes in the correct orientations when you rivet these two together. The blueprints, of course, tell you which holes go where. You've got your seat bracket that goes here, your seat harness bracket that goes here. So make sure that's correct. So you can see we've gotten bulkhead four riveted. This is the number three skin that we had just hung. We've installed the lower laundrons. We'll get a shot of that from the inside here in a second. And then we've hung the number two skins with Clecos. And right now, all we're going to do is worry about this front row of rivets. Once that's done, then we can worry about this second row. Looking inside the fuselage, you can see that we have riveted into the number three skins the number three laundrons. And we do not have yet the lower laundrons, and actually we can't do that until after bulkhead 2 is in place. You'll see down here, we have three rivets, skin to skin rivets that you need to install before you put the upper laundrons in place. Once you've installed those rivets, then you can put the upper laundrons in place. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and open up every other hole on bulkhead 3. We're going to go ahead and do the two two and two holes on the upper laundrons. Then we're going to rivet bulkhead three and the laundrons. But when you're riveting bulkhead three for now, go ahead and leave these tabs down here open. 
You only want to rivet these two tabs for now. You can deal with this once the airplane is right side up again. And when you do get to doing this, make sure that you're paying attention to your overlap pattern. It needs to be right over left, and then of course, front over back. The upper Londrons are now riveted in, as is bulkhead three. When you're skinning the, this number two skin and the number three skin, you'll notice there's some flex here. That flex is normal, and it might create some lopsidedness down there at the belly curve. That doesn't matter so much. What we're looking for is that these two rivet lines along the belly line up with each other when you pull that curve into shape. Okay. When you install your lower, your lower um, bulkhead three lower and your uh, the rear stub, this will pull itself into place naturally. So don't don't worry about that too awful much just yet. We've also left out these number two longerons because we need to get bulkhead two into place first. You'll see here we also have some shims. These shims you may or may not need to use on bulkhead two. We include them in the kit anyway. Whether or not you use them is totally up to your judgment on how tight the skin is fitting bulkhead two. Naturally, we want it to be a nice tight fit. And you may even use a combination, you know, of maybe the sides, but not the not the top, not the bottom. Um, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, they're, they're, they, these are just here to make everything fit a little bit better. So let's go ahead and take a look at bulkhead two. All right, so this is bulkhead two along with the front stubs. We mate these here at the factory so you don't need to worry about um, opening up these holes or these holes. These are the wire lug holes. These are for the counter wires and the ones up at the top are for the landing wires. Again, you don't need to worry about reaming those. We do ream them here at the factory. Um, Early kits do have instructions for reaming them, so make sure that your bolts fit in before you skin your fuselage, just to make sure that you, you know, we did indeed do this at the factory. So, as you can see, Bulkhead 2 is a very high quality weldment. Um, it's all TIG welded. Everything we do here is TIG weld. We don't use any MIG weld. I know some other manufacturers use MIG weld. Um, I don't like that, especially for this particular design. So uh, we do use TIG welding. Um, one thing you can do up here, well, keep in mind these aren't the bolts that um, we'll be using in the kits. These are some scrap bolts we had on hand. Um, when you get your kit, you might notice that this is lopsided or oversized. It is okay to grind this back, this pad here, on the strut until it looks pleasing to your eye. Okay, we usually use about an eighth inch away from the weld bead, an eighth inch away from the edge of the weld bead is our guideline for getting that right. Now, do not ever grind into one of our welds, okay? Um, sometimes we'll grind a weld here at the factory for whatever reason. That's because we know the load's going through the weld. We know um, who did the work. We know how to um, account for design um, traits. So don't ever, ever grind into a weld. Okay, that could cause some severe problems. You might also notice here that your tubes are a little bit long, too long for the bolt. Those tubes can be trimmed down on assembly to fit your bolt. Um, again, do not grind into that weld. If you need to um, remove some material from, from that tube, it's probably only going to be about a 16th inch, 8th inch, somewhere in there. We use them long here because of, of how, how it needs to be welded, and we don't want that that edge melt, melting back as we weld. So um, again, you'll probably need to shorten those up. Do not go into the weld bead. It's better to, to get a longer bolt. So how do you know it's front and back on bulkhead two? We've got your struts here. And of course, it's like any other airfoil shape. The fat side goes to the front. And then you also notice here, we've got the rollover post socket. That's sloped to match the front wind, uh, wind screen. So that's how you tell what's the front and back on bulkhead two. Um, if these aren't yet opened up on this control uh, torque tube mount, go ahead and open those two holes up to 3 sixteenths. And you can just use a regular old drill bit to do those. Um, sometimes we do them here, sometimes we don't. It really depends on, on how fast we're going and, and what kind of mood we're in. So. That is something that you need to verify is, is drilled. So that's the overview on bulkhead two and the front stubs. 
Um, now I'll go ahead and show you how to install this unit to the fuselage um, as you continue skinning the fuselage. One of the parts you're going to need to build when you do your fuselage, and, and not yet, but um, is bulkhead 3 lower, also known as the rear stub spar. Now, one of those plates in the rear stub spar has these tabs on it, okay? We need to open these holes up right here, these big ones, to 5 8 inch. I suggest you use a unibit and come in from the side halfway and then that side halfway just to get a nice tight hole that's not triangular. We're going to use this to pin to bulkhead 3. And you'll see some matching holes on bulkhead 3 and you can actually open those up with a unibit as well. Now if you've already riveted your rear stub spar together, that's fine. You can use that whole assembly. Um, but for now, we're just going to use this. And when the time comes to build your, your rear stub spar, make sure that you're cutting these out. These, these are supposed to be holes. We don't cut those out here at the factory because it's, it's um, an easy way for you to get some of your, your fabrication points. Um, so when you cut these out, Make sure that you take down these tabs, knock down these tabs um, to where it's flat. Make sure you're deburring this whole thing flawlessly. This thing sees a tremendous amount of load, and you want to make sure that when you're flying, this doesn't buckle up on you. So um, treat this with the utmost respect. There's a caution for that in the blueprints. Um, this piece, treat like your life depends on it because it does. Uh, so we've already opened these up to 5 8 inch. We've already opened up the holes on bulkhead 3 to 5 8 of an inch to match. We're going to go ahead and pin this. Once we pin these in place, it's going to give us a guide for hanging bulkhead 2. So um, we'll go ahead and pin that now, and then we'll uh, keep going from there. Okay, so up to this point, you've built the entire aft section of the fuselage from bulk bulkhead 2 aft, right? And in doing that, you realize how handy these CAD drill, these uh, computer cut holes are. These computer drilled holes prevent you from making a crooked fuselage. There's no possible way that you could make a crooked fuselage if you're paying attention to what you're doing, up until bulkhead two. So if you do get a crooked fuselage, it's because you did not pay attention to what you're doing here and keeping things straight. So really pay attention to how you install bulkhead two, okay? You'll see that we've pinned the bulkhead three lower into place. We put this one on the back side of the bulkhead. It doesn't matter where you put it for now because you're not actually installing it. You're only using it um, for alignment purposes. So we've pinned it to bulkhead three with 5 8 inch pins. The next step after you get that installed, or pinned I should say, is to mark some prediction lines here, okay? This prediction line right here, there's a little line there. We put an arrow to show where it's at because once that's covered up by the skin, you're not gonna know where it's at and it sucks to hunt for it. You want this line to be two and an eighth inches aft of this front edge on the skins, okay? That should be the overlap from the front skin to the rear skin. So go ahead and do that now, mark it out. You want them every, oh, four to six inches across the whole entire skin all the way around. And after that, we went ahead and put bulkhead two into position. Now, you're gonna to need to install your, um, your shims at this time if you decide to use them. Now, we noticed there's a lot of slop in here, so we installed those shims that took that slop out. Part of the reason the shims are there is because when you weld stuff, it tends to shrink. It'll expand, and then it'll contract a little bit more than it expanded. Um, so that's why the shims are, are in there. Um, when you're installing the shims, you want to pay attention to the Londron alignment up here in relation to um, these tabs, okay? Now, it's going to be off a little bit. That's just because there's so much flex in this whole unit right now. Um, so don't worry about, you know, if it's too far off. If you can get a clamp on there and pull everything into square, then that's close enough, all right? So now that everything's installed at this point, the stubs are installed, bulkhead 2 is installed. Um, also, make sure the bulkhead 2 is the correct, um, is in the correct way. This, again, slopes with the windscreen, so we know that it's incorrect. We verified that we already opened up all these holes. 
Again, we do that here at the factory, um, but you're going to want to double check to make sure that nothing got missed. It's a rare occasion that that actually happens, and you need to let us know if it does happen. But um, it would suck to have to ream this thing after everything's installed. So we got bulkhead two installed. We verified that bulkhead two, this flange here, is flush with the front edge of this skin. Okay, that's how we know we're going to get this thing straight right off the bat. This should be flush. Now, up at the top, because we don't actually have these rivets in, there's a lot of flexing up at the top with the skins, all right? So there, it may not be perfectly flush up here, but what you want to look at is that it's flush everywhere else. Um, once this is flush and you're happy with the fitment, um, look down the fuselage to check alignment between the stubs. So what you're looking for is you want to close one of your eyes and make sure that your line of sight is directly right smack dab down the middle of this fuselage. From this point here all the way to the tail. Okay. When you do that, keep your eye closed, don't move your head. You want to make sure you have contrast back here between the stubs or after the stub. And you want to make sure that both sides, right here and right here, are the same symmetrical to each other. Now keep in mind this isn't going to always be exactly the same angle as right here. We're talking it might be off just half a degree and it's enough to throw your eyeball off. So what you're really concerned about is this outer point. And that's why you want to make sure your line of view is centered because if it's off center it could skew your results. So again look here, here, left and right should be the same. Once they are we know that the bulkhead is not twisted. We know that it's straight Re-verify that everything is flush here. Once you've done that, go ahead and install clamps. And then guess what? Re-verify that everything is square still. Once that's done, you can actually come in here, and we care right now only about between the long drums, but you can drill with a six inch bit. It's especially easy um, from inside out, okay? So I've already done one side. I'm going to come in here and um, I'm going to go ahead and come lower. Again, only between long rounds. It doesn't really matter which of these holes I'm grabbing. Okay, there's one and we'll do one more. When you get up top here, you need to watch out that you don't hit the stub. So now we have our Clico points. We're going to go ahead and um, stop there. We're going to do three per side. And again, that's on the aft side. Um, I suppose you could do the front side as well. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and stop there. What we're going to do is um, pull this stub back off now that we know everything is straight, right? We know these holes are drilled. We can't get this to twist wrong now. We're going to go ahead and um, pull the stubs off. We're going to get the forward skins on. When we do the forward skins, we're going to sneak some these clamps right here back in through the wire lug holes. And we're going to clamp the forward skins into position using our prediction lines here. And when you follow your prediction lines, you should see that that skin matches up with all those lines all the way around. Okay, we've got these forward skins, the final skins hung. And a couple things to note inside the airplane. Um, first off, on some early kits, you'll see some holes drilled here on the bulkhead, on the steel part. Don't worry about those holes, okay? We've um, d done a design change. You don't need to drill those rivet holes. There are, however, some skin-to-skin -skin holes that you need to drill um, on both sides. And you'll see those back there behind the bulkhead and... Um, here as well. And those, if you forget to, rip, to rivet these before you put the lines rounds in, that's fine. When you rivet this skin to skin here, it can actually be uh, the BSPQ42 rivets, the, the blind rivets. So um, don't panic if you saw your lines rounds and have forgotten that. Just use, it'll be covered by the, the wing fairing. Just go ahead and use the BSPQ42s. Um, so we, to, to control the curvature on, on this skin, we installed with Clico's bulkhead number one. 
So this is the bulkhead that carries the firewall, uh, your, your rudder pedal foot well. One thing you want to take note of is how it's positioned within the skins. We've got a quarter inch tooling hole right here. That tooling hole becomes the engine mount pad hole. So this quarter inch hole should be in line with the center of these two rivet lines here for the upper long drones. Um, if it's not, then that means your bulkhead is not correctly positioned. So one thing that we noticed as we were getting ready to hang this skin is that there was a lot of flex in this panel here and it was giving us false readings on our prediction lines. Our prediction lines were perfect from here to here and quarter inch off up here. So we looked inside, we pulled this skin forward with this F clamp here till it was flush with the front edge of bulkhead two. We decided to put some quarter inch bolts in these holes here just to make sure that they're clear. Now these, you might see some misalignment in the skins here, that's fine. We're more concerned about huge misalignments between these wire lug holes. And you can see there that the bulkhead is centered within the hole and that the wire lug holes are more or less lined up with each other. You can also see that now all of our prediction lines fall on the edge of that skin. So we know that that skin is appropriately placed. What we did do is we decided it was easier to see the holes inside out from the front side of the bulkhead instead of looking down in the cockpit. So we did redrill these three holes here from the front side of the bulkhead too. Again, inside out, we verified that nothing had moved. Bulkhead two is still perfectly square. What we're gonna do now is that both sides are Clecoed, um, is we're gonna go ahead and finish drilling eighth inch with our six inch, six inch drill bit, all the rivet holes on bulkhead two. Now, Sometimes these get a little bit crooked, right? You need to apply a little bit of pressure on your six inch bit to keep it square with the skin when you're drilling inside out. So if you get a bunch of holes that are misaligned, don't panic because the next step is to drill these outside in. And of course, we're gonna start with the number 30 because we wanna see if we can get away with eighth inch uh, rivets here. But if you find out that a number 30 isn't squaring these holes up from the outside in, Go ahead and use a number 21 drill bit from the outside in because we've got this designed such that on bulkhead two, you can use either eighth inch rivets or the 530 seconds rivets. And the 530 seconds rivets again are a, are a number 21 drill bit. Now you can't use both because they are different head sizes and you'll notice a different, um, a different pattern. If you wanted to, you could use 530 seconds from here to here and eighth inch, you know, from there up. That's fine, but again, we prefer that you use the same size all the way around bulkhead too. Um, and so we're gonna find out what we use here. It looks like it's drilling pretty well, so we might be able to get away with those eighth inch, um, those eighth inch rivets. So after we get this riveted, the next step is to go ahead and install this number two launcher on. And then the next time you see the airplane, it will be finished through the quick build stage. So. Um, again, if you don't buy the quick build kit, you're doing this yourself and this customer did buy the quick build kit. So that's why we're using it as an example. And um, we'll walk around the airplane and, and show you exactly what that, that quick build entails. Before we pull this plastic off this fuselage, one final note. When you're riveting bulkhead to focus on here to here initially and then worry about from here to the rollover post after this is riveted. And make sure when you do all your drilling in bulkhead two that this is clicked across the top. Now, if you rivet from the bottom up and just keep going, um, what can happen is you might get a pucker here. You gotta displace this metal somewhere, right? So it, by riveting from here to here and then working from here up, you end up pushing that metal into the rollover post and eliminating any puckers. Now, if you do get a small pucker here, don't panic too much because this right here, this blue line, that's where the windscreen band goes on the civilian windscreens. And of course the military windscreens cover this up even further and you have the wire lug coming out there. So if you do get a pucker here, don't panic. Um, it's gonna be covered. You're gonna be removing a little bit of material here. Um, if it's huge, then let us know if it, if it bothers you and we can um, walk you through how to fix it. There you have it. We finished up a quick build fuselage as you can see by the Clecos. Some of that riveting is left for the customer. The customer needs to do some of that in order to meet the FAA's 51% rule requirements. Um, this is how it goes out the door.
perfectly straight fuselage, all done without any kind of special fixtures right on top of the table. Next, we'll look at a fuselage that a customer is building, and he's a little further along, so you can see a few of the differences in how it's sent out versus um, what gets installed later. So uh, let's go take a look at that. This is a fuselage that one of our customers has underway. Here's the back of the airplane bulkhead eight. You can see this is the stabilizer attachment box. This is where the stabilizer spar attaches to. You've got your rudder hinge, and of course you've got your uh, tailwheel mount inside the airplane for a nice clean look. Moving forward, we've got the vertical stabilizer keel. We've got the forward horizontal stabilizer spar carry through. And we'll move up to the cockpit here. Now, this customer is almost done with his um, fuselage. Aside from, you can see that he's got to install the belly skin here still. He did take advantage of some good weather this time of year to um, do some, some painting inside of his airplane. Uh, but you can also see that he's got the, the widened Londrons, the military style Londrons. That's a little bit different on this airplane than the standard airplanes. Um, so that's why it looks different here. He does have his seat belt, his shoulder harness lug here. The instrument panel goes here, of course, and then the baggage compartment is up here. And the baggage compartment does have a back wall, which isn't installed yet, and it does have a hatch um, door, which isn't installed yet. You can also see looking underneath the back of the seat stru structure. And you can see that the rudder pedals um, do have some deflectors on the side of the on the side of the seats there. Those deflectors make it so you can um, you always have positive engagement with the rudder pedals. You don't slip off and hit the seat. Um, forward, we do have uh, you can see um, a little bit of bulkhead too here. But looking aft, you can also see the baggage compartment itself. And again, this does have a door on it. You've got some pass-throughs here for electrical or whatever whatever else you may need. Um, the baggage does have walls here too. So you could put your pedostatic and electrical through here and install those side walls and have no interference with, with the electrical and baggage. Moving all the way to the front, you can see, again, this is the front seat. You can see a little bit of the front seat structure here. Um, control stick torque tube mount, some pass-throughs pass for electrical, uh, some, um, he's got his engine bearing Londrons in, his engine mount pads are in, and of course his rotor pedal mount. The rotor pedal mount sticks out a little bit from bulkhead one, and that's because there is a foot well that he installs here on the firewall. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll walk you back through the cockpit going back again, but you can see that this customer is making some pretty swift progress. It's a very simple airplane, very easy to build. Just for one last look. Very, very simple structure. So, um, we've got your elevator idler here. Forgot to point that out. That carries the loads from the control stick up to the elevator. Um, your lap belt lugs and your seat back attachment angles. Uh, very, very, very simple stuff. So, um, but yeah, now that you've seen it all, um, if you have any questions, be sure to let us know. Uh, we're very easy to get a hold of, email, phone, whatever is the best way for you. Um, look forward to hearing from you.